Welcome everyone. It's the first January Wednesday of 2021. So um, we're still in COVID, but we have a new guest host uh, for our Wednesday morning series. So Kelly Gunter will be joining us on um, the first week of each month on the sex and relationship healing.com site. So for those of you watching this video, um, we would welcome having you join our sessions live and be able to ask questions. For those of you joining us, you can ask questions by putting them in the Q&A. So Kelly's topic is hold on pain and surviving trauma and maintaining sobriety. And so that's kind of a whopper of a topic. Um, I first met Kelly um, and had the opportunity to do a Super Saturday Recovery Summit with her. Um, sh she's written several books and she can she will introduce herself and talk more about those. But what was what I really connected with was her genuine uh, genuineness and her willingness to trudge through what has been a painful past for her and find healing. And um, that really, you know, that really connected. And that's how we find recovery and healing is um, not just shoving it in the closet. So, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Kelly, tell a little bit about yourself. And I think you've got a topic to share with us today. Yeah. But again, for those of you that are, have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We, we welcome them. She'll present for a little bit and then we'll um, answer your questions. So thank you. Well, hi, I'm happy to be here. You know, always, Tammy, everything is, um, I just think, so moving and healing when we can share our truth and stand in our truth of who we are. And that's what I love about all of the groups and the programs that you run, because no one gets anywhere without being honest and forthright and genuine. So definitely, I've shared my story with the world, and I continue to. Um, it's a lot to say in a quick part, but um, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. I was raped repeatedly in my own home by my older brothers from the age of a, about seven until 14. And that trauma that was never disclosed or allowed to heal ultimately was the catalyst for numerous addictions. Um, I had a food addiction, ended up weighing 400 pounds. I, if, I stayed that way for many years, for almost two decades. And then having weight loss surgery, I lost 243 pounds, had the extra skin removed, and but I still never dealt with my trauma. I never dealt with what caused me to use food as comfort. So I developed cross addiction after cross addiction after cross addiction which ultimately ended up in me losing everything, going through just some nightmarish court situations and um, a lot of mistakes. And that's when I went into treatment. And so now that was five years ago and I've been sober for five years. And I wrote my book, You Have Such a Pretty Face um, in 2017. Um, that book, it does speak about the 243 pound weight loss but more importantly, it speaks about the fact that losing weight didn't heal all my problems. It wasn't the magic eraser for my life's issues. And I think it's important to point out that I was a therapist for 28 years. So I have a master's degree in counseling. You would think someone who had that for a career would be able to recognize and see the signs of unhealed trauma and the addiction. And the problem was no matter how fast I ran, I couldn't outrun myself. I take me with me wherever I go. And so ultimately all of the shame that surrounded that sexual abuse, all of those feelings of I'm not enough and I'll never be enough, you know, I didn't want the world to know that. And so ultimately all of those things had to be dealt with. And, you know, it's difficult to dig into the wound and clean it out, but that's the only way we heal because obviously we can't heal what we don't acknowledge. And um, so that's where my healing journey began. And initially when I wrote my book, I never planned on speaking. I never planned on sharing anything more than what's contained in the book. And so ultimately, one day I was just trolling YouTube about four years ago, looking for some type of inspiration for someone who had been through the same kind of things I'd been through, but more importantly, suffered with addiction, made mistakes, and was just trying desperately to rebuild. 
and I, I came across the story of a woman and she told her story and, you know, she went through a lot, but she didn't make any mistakes. She didn't suffer from addiction. You know, she was hurt by someone and ultimately she, you know, had a wonderful healing story and turned out well. But I needed to see somebody who made mistakes, somebody who messed up, someone who, you know, had gone through something similar and came out on the other side of it. So it was on that day that I finally said, you know what, God, like I will share my story with the world because what I know and recognize is that we need to hear from people who have scars, people who are genuine enough to say, these are mistakes I made in the blur of addiction. These are the traumas I suffered and yet here I stand. And so it was then that I said, I'm going to speak, which had never been ever my, what I thought my purpose was. And so three and a half years later, here I am and all over the world and just, you know, sharing it with everyone. And so with that, that's where I say in my book that hope stands for hold on pain ends. And that's really what I want to do in this whole series for the next year is every month have a different topic that inspires how we hold on to that hope. Because, I mean, keeping it completely honest, yes, 2020 has ended. And, you know, we see all of the posts, we see the people on media saying, oh, it's a new year, a fresh start, a new me. You know, and certainly no one could be happier to see 2020 end than me. But, and 2020 will always have this asterisk. Look at, look at the things that our society has gone through. I mean, all of the lost loved ones and I, the insurmountable grief. You know, I was a grief therapist for the first five years of my career. And I cannot imagine the pain of people who had to watch their loved ones die on FaceTime and couldn't hold their hand and couldn't be there with them and how that can be so haunting forever you know that my loved one was alone with strangers when they passed and so we have that we have the ongoing pandemic you know that had so many different obstacles and hurdles for people to overcome because when you're dealing with issues of sobriety and trying desperately to hold on to it the pandemic just through all kinds of irons in the fire that made that so, so difficult. And I definitely wanna talk about that, especially for people who have PTSD or anxiety or depression. You know, being isolated gave so many feelings of being powerless again. And so this fresh start for everybody, you know, this fresh start of, oh, it's a brand new year. I mean, have you heard that? Have you heard many people saying that? Yeah. And I mean, new like, year, new you. And I was like, well, it doesn't feel mm-hmm. like it. So, <laughs> right. And so, for people who exactly, I've seen new year, new you so many times. And I've seen, oh, 2021 is going to be my year. This is going to be my year. And so, I look at the people who are hurting, the people who are suffering. You know, we have the serenity prayer where we say, I'm going to relinquish these things, I'm gonna surrender these things and I can't control them. But when we have grown up in families where we were had to endure abuse, where the unthinkable was our everyday, where our only certainty was uncertainty. You know, I mean, many of us grew up knowing the only thing we could count on was that there was no one we could count on. And so when you have those things, that's what leads people to try to numb that pain with unhealthy choices. And so everybody in recovery has been there. So for those people, for many, many people, all that 2021 represents was the turn of a page on a calendar. I mean, you know, I do life coaching. And so I have so many clients who say, I'm still hurting. I'm still in pain and I'm still suffering. And so it might be a new year, but my reality is things are still the same. And so how do we get past that? That's the question for people. How do we get past that? How do we, how do we get to a place that we can be like new year, new me, (laughs) And you know? And the way we do that is by clinging to hope with everything we have. You know, like I said earlier, 
in my book, I say that hope stands for hold on pain ends. And I can say from a very, very personal standpoint, I existed so many years in darkness. So I know how darkness feels. For people who feel like they are just encapsulated in that darkness right now, I know how that feels. And one thing I can promise anyone who feels like they're trapped in that darkness is if you look around, you will see my footprints there. And if you see my footprints there, then that means somehow I was able to eventually navigate myself out of it. And if I was able to escape the darkness, anybody can escape the darkness. Because I know I've shared with you, and I don't have time to go into all of those today, you know, that's my whole second book is The Homecoming Queen of Crazy Town, which talks all about the darkness and, and how all the unhealthy coping mechanisms I use to survive it. But when you grow up in and you're forced to endure abusive situations, then it's impossible to in any way respect your self-worth. And so people might say, well, what does self-worth have to do with darkness? Well, it has everything to do with darkness because when you're trapped in that darkness, you begin to believe the lies that those negative thought patterns that you learned as a child whisper to you constantly. It's never gonna get better. It's never gonna get better. You can't do this. You might as well give up. Go ahead and drink. Go ahead and smoke. Do the cocaine. Eat, 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 whatever. Stay at the casino. What does it matter? You know, I mean, those negative thoughts are multiplied exponentially in the darkness. And as survivors of trauma and abuse, you know, the hard and different thing is, is that we learned everything gets worse in the darkness. And so most people who were abused didn't hate their abusers. They hated themselves. And even if they did hate their abuser, they still hated themselves. And so ultimately what happens with that? They self-medicate. And so as we grow and get older and we go up into life, those survival skills as a child turn into incredibly unhealthy coping mechanisms as an adult, but that's the way we numb the pain. So when you're working hard to achieve sobriety and healthy living, then you have to be careful, especially after a year of 2020, not to slip back into things that are like re repetition compulsion. Are you familiar with that? Um, okay, where, you know, for anybody who isn't, when we've had- I was gonna say, please do explain yeah. no, cause yeah. yeah. When we've had trauma in our early childhood, we may inadvertently attract similar situations of abuse or rejection as a hope that by repeating the cycle and see of past pain, we can recreate it, but have a better ending this time. And so that's why we choose partners or situations that are incredibly familiar to what we endured as children. And another one that we have that's really important here is identification with the aggressor. And I think that's super important for this because what that is, in, it's speaking of children who are enduring abuse, they identify with the aggressor in the way that I'm bad. Like I'm bad, the aggressor isn't bad, I'm bad. And the reason children do that, it's a coping mechanism, it's a defense mechanism. If they say I'm bad, then they can be hypervigilant and be the best they can be. And what does that do? That gives them a sense of hope that maybe this will end, that the pain will end. And because if they recognize and say, oh, this adult is bad, or this person who's abusing me is bad, then they're powerless. So they, they absorb that, like I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad, so that there's hope that it can end. And so that defense mechanism, that when we take it into adulthood with us, like all of the craziness in our life and all the mistakes, because that's all we know, it's what we've learned. And so when we have this really, really difficult year, like 2020, it's easy to backslide into those things. And all of the progression we've made, all of the success we've made is lost to us. And, and we start to think those same things again. You know, that I'm not worthy and I'm not 
I'm not capable of keeping my sobriety or capable. I don't deserve good things. And, and that, those negative thoughts are lies. And so we have to be careful and cognizant so that we don't start to backslide. And, you know, healing isn't linear. Healing is a jagged back and forth. And, you know, even if we start to slip, we can say, you know, why am I having these feelings again? And when we can understand them, then it's easier for us to get in line with it and get back to the help, the healthy skills that we've learned that have helped us get that sobriety. I mean, we all know healing takes it's step by step by step, little increments. And, you know, I always like to say, well, Rome wasn't built in a day. It takes time to heal. Unfortunately, it did burn in one day. And that's how quickly we can lose our sobriety too. So, you know, we don't want to slide back into that. And, you know, with my life coaching that I do with people, what I've really learned along the way is people don't want your sympathy. And, you know, I go back to, like, I remember when I was in grad school working on my master's, I had a professor who said, you know, people don't need sympathy. And at the time I was like, why not? You know, I mean, you'd think people want it. And, and like he actually said, if you were looking for sympathy, you'll find it in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. You know, that's what he said. And so um, like that stuck in my mind. But the reason that people don't want sympathy, what, what people do want is empathy. That's what people want. They want compassion because in the 28 years that I've worked with people, I found that the two words they want to hear are not you should, like you should do this or you should do that. What they want to hear is someone who says me too. Like my pain might be different from yours, but I know what it feels like to suffer. And if I know what it feels like to suffer and I can relate to you, then I can tell you that it gets better. And that's really what people are looking for. And again, that just goes back to hope. And so that compassion, we have to also be able to give it to ourselves. Self-compassion is so important because many, many times you're going to deal with people who are not going to give you compassion. The world can be incredibly cold. We lose friends, we lose people we love, we lose the supports that we thought would always be there. And so learning to have that self-compassion is so crucial. And also giving compassion to others because what we want is what we should be able to give to other people. I think it's so crucial that we never get so busy in our own lives that we have lost the capability to stop and say, I've been there and, and remember what we needed and try to give it to someone else. And that's also so empowering for us. So we've had this crappy year and we're trying to move forward, but we're still feeling like nothing's better. And so we start that with compassion for us. Yes, I've had a rough life. Yes, I've gone through a lot of things. And yes, I've worked my butt off to get my sobriety and to achieve it and to maintain it. And so I'm going to be a little bit easy on myself and I'm going to understand that this is rough and I might need support. And that compassion is just empowering. And going back to the next piece, I think that's so important in the hope is um, when you go back to the two things that I explained as far as the, the memories and the identification with the aggressor, that's all about perception. You know, as a child, when we had to see, oh, we said, I'm bad, because that gave us hope that it could end. That's perception. And perception is everything. So I have clients who say to me, oh, Kelly, my life just sucks, you know? And I say, well, like it, it might be true that right now there are situations in your life that suck. And I will stand here and scream to the sky with you that that sucks and it hurts and it's hard and it's difficult. But perception is everything. And you have survived every moment of abuse that you went through. You have survived every bit of trauma that you went through. And you will survive healing from it too. You will survive 2020. 
you will survive this pandemic, you will get through, and you will keep moving forward. And I think you just have to look at the situation of each individual person. People don't understand, and life is complex. And so a lot of times people deal with other people's perception of them. And they say to me, well, Kelly, I like my, my dad abused me, but we like have gone to therapy together and he's still in my life and I still love him. And the truth is you don't have to stop loving someone who hurts you. You don't have to stop loving someone to be able to say your behavior towards me was inappropriate, damaging and dangerous. And in the same breath, you don't have to love somebody or have a relationship with somebody simply because you share their DNA. But the world will tell you to. The world will tell you what you should do. People will always say, oh, you shouldn't have a relationship with that person. They were an addict or they hurt you or whatever went on. And that's where perception is so important because we can't allow our shame and our self-blame when we're sort of drowning in that we take on other people's perceptions and opinions and we worry about that more than what our truth is. You know, what is my truth? My truth is I've healed from this and I either choose or I don't choose to share my story or to have a relationship with this person. And the world will constantly tell you, this is what you should do. And so that's where our perception is so important. And if you think about a tulip, you know, you, you drop a tulip bulb in the ground in the fall and so that it will come up in the spring. And, you know, so here's that bulb. And if a bulb had a thought, it would say, clearly this is my grave. <laughs> I've been dropped in this ground. I'm surrounded in darkness. But the truth is that tulip is going to bloom. And so that's where perception comes in. And as people, we have to say, Am I buried or am I planted? Because darkness feels the same for a while. And our perception is what allows us to grow. And the, the final piece of that that I think is so important is resiliency. Because what resiliency says is, I'm going to grow whether you water me or not. And so we look at those three things so we have compassion, we have perception, and we have resiliency. And what they do, put together, if you put that together, it's CPR, compassion, perception, resiliency. And so in 2021, what we use is we have to jumpstart hope back alive. We have to give our hope a just a big jolt of CPR because that's what will keep us going on our bad days, on our dark days, that's what will keep us from reaching for the wrong things. And that's what will keep us moving forward where we want to be and living our own best lives. There will always be darkness. And looking for the tiniest shred of light in the darkness is what gets us through. And, you know, there were so, so many times that I would just think I can't make it one more hour, not even to the end of the day. I mean, I would fall asleep crying. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying. I would wake up in the morning crying. And that's an incredibly painful way to live. And only the tiniest spark of hope, like maybe something can get better, is what got me through those days. And so that's why hope is crucial. That's why this whole series is going to be hold on, pain ends. Because for so many people, that's all they have. All they have right now is hope that maybe tomorrow will be better and it will get better. There's never been a storm in the history of the world that didn't eventually end. And we will survive this storm too. And we'll survive it together and we'll move forward. And that's why each month I have different topics that I want to tackle. Um, next month I have the topic of the people you, you, the people you choose and the people you lose and like who's on your team because it's critical. And, um, and I think all of us have learned that we can have a whole lot of people sitting on our bench. That doesn't mean anybody's on our team. 
And so, you know, those are the kind of topics we're going to talk about. And 2021 can be as positive as we want it to be. There will always be obstacles. There will always, I mean, the pandemic could end tomorrow and it could just be a miraculous cure and there will be new obstacles and there will be other things that we have to deal with. So developing that CPR for us to be able to get through those alone, because that's the one thing the pandemic hit us with the hardest that people have never had to deal with. People couldn't see their own families. People couldn't go to work and people were isolated many times with people who were hurting them, but, and also just totally isolated. Some people were completely alone. And so building up that resiliency is something that is just really, really crucial going forward. Oh, I can't hear you. There. I, I, well, I know, but uh, my phone has been ringing off the hook. So oh, I've been, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have put it on Do Not Disturb, but it would have probably zip, zipped in anyway. So, so <laughs> much good stuff. I, I, you know, when you're I, like, I have a black thumb. So, um, when you talked about tulips, I was like, oh, my mine would be buried because it wouldn't it wouldn't come back to life. But I love that analogy, and I probably won't ever look at a tulip again without you know thinking of, or uh, you know another bulb or whatever. And you know the compassion. I was like, uh, you, you know, I have had to to be compassionate with myself particularly for um, my feelings and, you know, just grieving, grieving the loss of some of the things. But the other thing, you know, the resiliency, I, I have felt that um, I had to look for, you know, because it felt like everything was taken away and everything happened to me and everything else. And I was like, I have choices. I have fewer choices right now, but I still had to look for, you know, where do I have choices and what can I choose? And sometimes it was just self-compassion of like, you know, I'm going, I'm going to tackle this. I'm not going to tackle that. You know, I, I need a meeting, whatever it is I, you know, I need. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I have thought so often, you know, for people such as yourself, you know, to be abused and have to sit at the breakfast table the next morning with your abusers and like how, how, no wonder people compartmentalize because you know there's this piece of you and what you said about kids you know absolutely kids are always going the adults know best and or the older people or whatever you know so it must be me and why you know I, I must I need to do something differently so there's so much good stuff I'm really looking forward to you know having you um, uh, continue along with us so we've got lots of of questions. So we'll start with these, but if, if you are joining us have some questions, please feel free to, you know, um, put them in the Q&A and we'll do our best. So questions or I can't. You should be able to, if you I click can't. on Q&A at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to follow along. Oh, I'm going to read them to you too. Oh, okay. So, okay. so how does trauma affect our relationship with others and our relationship with those closest to us? That's a great question. Yeah. Well, um, trauma affects everything in so many ways, because ultimately, I mean, it torpedoes our self-worth. So if we don't have self-worth, then the next thing we're doing is getting into relationships with people who don't treat us well, and we accept it because we don't think we're worth anything better, or we don't think we can get anybody better. Um, we can have a lack of trust. We almost always have a lack of trust because we've been hurt and our boundaries have been completely obliterated by people who were supposed to keep us safe. And so having trust with a person, it affects every trusting relationship. It affects the way that we can be vulnerable with partners and with friends. And um, so she said, how does it affect our relationship with ourselves? I mean, it just, children who are sexually abused, like you said, um, typically when I speak somewhere, I say, how many rape victims have to sit down and have dinner at night with the person who raped them in the morning? How many rape victims have to hand their rapist a Christmas present? And so there's no way you grow up in that type of situation. And you, like, I had no idea what healthy love looked like. And I can say for all of the men who I dated and were involved with prior to going into treatment, I couldn't even tell they were toxic because I was toxic too. And so you don't recognize that and, and you try so hard to hide your brokenness from you and everybody else. And so genuine living is difficult, but all of those things can be healed. 
all of those things can get better and you can develop healthy relationships. And, you know, you really have to be able to look at yourself and say, what are my weaknesses in dealing with other people? You know, I mean, a lot of people, they, they cover it with a lot of things. People say to me, oh, Kelly, I have relationship issues. Maybe what you have is unresolved childhood issues presenting as relationship issues because People like to think, well, oh, certainly I'm 50 years old. What happened when I was seven doesn't matter. It does if you never dealt with it. And because trauma sits in the control room of our soul, quietly dictating many of the calamities of our life. And we don't realize what it is. We think we've set it on the shelf and we can ignore it, but it's in there and it's pulling all of our strings. And so being able to look at yourself and say, on you was honestly and in a very genuine fashion, what is my difficulty? Where do I struggle? And how is that possibly correlated to the trauma I suffered? And there's just so many different ways, but of course it affects every relationship in our life until we heal from it. So, so two things with that, you know, we at our Seeking Integrity Treatment Program, we have so many people that can't even identify that they have trauma. And I think, you know, things happen when when young uh, when a young child and so it's normalized as that's just part of my growing up and it isn't even identified as trauma. So, you know, so um, thoughts on how uh, and then the other piece of that, I guess, is I have so many people that go, oh, that's just too painful. I can't possibly deal with it. But when I'm hearing, you know, it's a con control room of my soul. Oh my gosh. You know, it's, it's navigating everything, even if I'm not aware of it. So, so how do we start being able and willing to, to deal? I mean, what happened with you then? Cause you said you went off to treatment. So how did you finally go? I have to deal with this. Oh, wow. Well, because I destroyed my entire life. I mean, I oh, there's I, that. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> I started a business and I ran that business successfully for 13 years. And then I, the final addiction that brought me to my knees was a gambling addiction. And I used money from that business to gamble. And my judgment was so skewed. I didn't even attempt to hide that. I turned in receipts. And I mean, it was my business, but it was a nonprofit. I didn't even realize that that would be something, you know, I was paying money back the whole way, but I didn't even realize that was something that was illegal. So I was convicted of theft and I, I lost everything. I lost my home, my cars, our belongings, all of my friends, all of my family. And I went into treatment and, but that's how powerful that shame is. Even when I was willing to tell everything because my judgment was so impaired, I was like, well, I didn't know. And so I go into treatment. I was willing to tell all of it, but I wasn't going to talk about the sex abuse. Mm -hmm. And so I was there for days before I ever, you know, they literally had to drag it out of me. And so, you know, that's why I speak because people don't have to destroy their lives. You know, you cannot heal what you don't acknowledge. And, you know, let my life be an example that if you have that trauma, like every behavior I had screamed trauma, but you know, I was a business person. I was successful. Like people just wrote it off. Oh, that's Kelly. You know, we aren't talking about people who we're not talking about the homeless people. We're talking about colleagues. We're talking about business people, doctors, lawyers, you know, people say, why is he do cocaine? Why is he cheat on his wife? Why does she sleep around? You know, it's that skewed judgment that trauma does because our brain forms differently when we experience trauma as children. That's not an opinion, that's a medical fact. And MRI scans of adult brains prove that, but it can be reconfigured, you can heal. And I think another thing that people, what people say to me a lot at book signings is, oh, Kelly, like I went through some things, but it wasn't as bad as what you went through. And the thing is that our brain can't differentiate between sex abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse. It's all interpreted in the same part of the brain. And so abuse is abuse is abuse. And all the brain knows is I'm being hurt. And so 
people want to minimize what they've been through. And, you know, I always say to people, you know, we've all been in a house of pain. We've just occupied a different room maybe. And so, you know, you see people who are coping the best way they know how, but you don't know what their pain is. So when you see somebody with those behaviors, you know, people just passed it off. Oh, Kelly just, you know, dates the worst men. Oh, Kelly loves to shop. Kelly loves to gamble. Kelly, you know, whatever it was, people just passed it off as, well, that's just her. And in hindsight, of course, every behavior I have or I had screamed, this is a girl who has something going on. But I ran from it my whole life until I ran from it till it caught me. That's the truth of it. And so that's why it's just so crucial to heal. Okay, next question. Um, the next question is, I am a partner of a sex addict in recovery. This person's in her early 30s. I have a history with an eating disorder and numerous sexual assaults. I have no, it was no accident that I ended up marrying a sex addict. Despite the years of therapy I received, there is still some residual shame about that. How do we deal with the shame around that? Yeah, you know, dealing with the shame of all of that. I mean, she's dealing with her own sexual assaults. Um, it's not surprising at all. She has an eating disorder. I mean, I was 400 pounds. You know, we find comfort where we can find it. And, um, you know, that trauma imprints on you. And so working on that shame, I think, is a daily thing. You know, a daily, I think that getting rid of that shame, I always say we have to slay the shame because that shame is so powerful. It just chokes the hope out of you. And, you know, what do we feed people who are starving? Or what will people who are starving, what will they eat? Anything you give them. So when we're starved for work, when we're starved for affection and love, we're gonna take any relationship that comes along. And we are going to be willing to let anything this person does slide because we don't, we don't want to be left. We don't want to be starved. And um, so ultimately that's about shame. And the way that we continue to chip away at shame is to make it an active part of healing every day. I never have a time that I'm not reading a book that is somehow promoting health and wellness and you know, survival and self-love and compassion. I keep my learning in that area active because you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so our trauma is something that we can't erase. But even though we do our healing work and we work really hard to recover, we have to stay active in that. Or like those old ghosts will continue to rattle their chains and, and we'll slip back into that. And so if we keep our kind of our souls full, if we keep our house full of learning and staying positive, you, you know, you can't ha haunt a house that's not there anymore. So tear down the house of shame and the house of I'm not worth anything and rebuild that and keep it full of learning and, and being in groups. There's so many groups on social media that are all about self-love and healing and support and survivors. I mean, I just think you have to actively pursue health, healing and self-worth. And that's the only way, because I just think that shame will always try to sneak back in. And if you let it get its foot in the door, it's going to pry in and take over everything. And I'm, I'm going to tag on to this one because, um, you know, it's no accident that you married a sex addict. And, and I, what I hear in this in just a little brief um, sentence is that you are somehow at fault. And I'm going to say the two of you somehow came together. There's a reason, you know, um, that you fit together. It is not, you know, we don't ascribe to codependency and that you're broken and all that. Clearly you have trauma. Clearly you were abused. I mean, they, I'm not, uh, so work to heal that um, is 
critically important, but you know, but it, you know, it isn't your fault that you, that he, he's a sex addict, he's a sex addict. So um, the other thing I was thinking about is Troy Love, who does the fourth week of the month on this, um, has a book called Finding Peace. And he talks about those voices, the shame voices and everything. And you know, how you can learn to go, oh yeah, I hear the judge, I hear the you know, politician, I hear the whatever voice, you know, that you identify it as. And you can say, thank you, I, I hear you. I know you're trying to help me and now I've got it from here. And so that's a really practical way of, you know, helping to address the shame. We talk often, you know, Brene Brown has done an amazing job of, you know, the shame um, voices. Shame is a useless totally useless, you know, emotion. It's, it's one of those guilt, you know, can, oh, okay. I, you know, I feel guilty because I, you know, I don't know, I didn't clean the sink or whatever, you know, but, you know, and so I'll do a better job of that, but it's not, um, you know, shame, you know, like it doesn't motivate me to do something differently or better. It just traps me, you know, that, that whole thing, the, the, the control center, you know, that is just trapping me and keeping me um, frozen and unable to, to proceed. So, so I'm glad you're here um, there. And, and as a partner, um, I'm going to remind everybody that we have the multiple drop-in groups from a pro-dependent lens uh, for partners on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, including on Wednesdays at 12.30 Pacific time, again, Thursday morning at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time, but there's one on Sunday, there's an old lady posse on Tuesday. So there's resources for you. Um, uh, Kelly has done one of the podcasts with Dr. Rob too, but there's a bunch of podcasts on sexandrelationshiphealing.com specifically for betrayed partners as well too. So so there's resources, but I'm, I'm super glad you're here and plugging in. So next question, what ways can we connect with others, support one another during the pandemic? Drop in groups, you're here. So what else, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, social media is kind of a double-edged sword, I think, for a lot of people. But um, in this situation, it's been, it can be incredibly helpful to connect with people and to find other people who are experiencing the same things you are, because literally there are groups on Facebook for everything. I mean, every possible support group in the world is on Facebook. I, when I first started looking at trauma groups and survivor groups, because I don't buy into that victim mentality, like I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor and I'm not even just a survivor. You know me, Tammy, I'm a weapon. <laughs> I'm a weapon. So against the darkness, but um, there's those um, types of groups there are, you know, you, you have to reach out to the people who you are close to and keep in touch with them. And, you know, our church did a thing where everybody just was sending cards to each mm -hmm. other and picking so many names out of the directory and sending it. And you just randomly get a card that says you aren't alone and different mm -hmm. things and, and just sending them out. Like that was the big thing. Sending those cards and everything out to people makes you feel better. And, you know, so I think we just have to take the effort to do that. Like everything we've been taught in our life, we can't do right now. And so um, being able to pick up the phone and call somebody and being able to send them a message on social media or email, um, Skype with people. You know, the biggest thing I really think there's so many powerful support groups that you can be a part of and so many websites like yours, a lot of the things are free. And, you know, just go there for the help. And so that, that, that's the best ways, I think, that you can reach out to people at this point and stay connected. Because it's easy at first people reach out and then they start to slack off a little bit. And then, you know, those negative thoughts, thoughts start telling people, oh, well, like, you know, it's one works both ways. Like you can't entertain those thoughts. You just have to reach out and continue to stay in contact with people. And and some degree of normalcy. So wear a mask, but go for a walk with a friend and don't even have to talk about recovery stuff. It's like, just, you know, go do something sort of normal. My daughter and I, she's staying with us during the pandemic and, and she and I had some errands to run and running errands felt sort of normal, you know, like it was, you know, mask on and all that kind of stuff. But like, just, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel kind of sort of normal, you know, like that, that helped, you know. I run, I hike, I do things, um, uh, again, socially distanced, but, but just being able to do something that is sort of normal is, 
helpful, you know, and ideally doing it with, you know, a friend so that you can have a sort of normal experience with them. So, right. Okay. Next question. How do we learn to accept compliments from others instead of, oh, uh, defaulting to negative self-talk? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. I used to do that all the time. Somebody would say, oh, Kelly, you're, you're, you're pretty or this or that. I'd be like, oh, I'm a mess. Like, the, you know, just mm -hmm. because it was just so hard to receive it. And the only way that I found to deal with that was just to force myself to just say, thank you. As hard as it was for me, I just had to start doing it. And, um, you know, and it would be hard. And sometimes with people, I would just be genuinely honest and say, you know, I'm really working on accepting compliments because it's hard for me. And so I'm just gonna say thank you. And because, you know, like, you're afraid then if you come across, if you just go, thank you, that people will be like, oh, I mean, we have so many thoughts about how we think we will be perceived. And so if it's critically difficult, then I said it many times, I'm real, that's something I'm really working on. I'm really working on learning to accept compliments instead of like dismissing them. So thank you. And people will understand right away. Oh, this is, this is awkward for her. So it's not that she's trying to be, you know, any type of way, people are incredibly gracious. I found that when you tell people what you're struggling with, people are incredibly kind. Well, and one of the things I think it's really easy, it's like, you know, uh, to either do the, oh, here's, I'm a hot mess, or mm -hmm. to, well, you too, and da, 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 you like, and com completely flip it really fast too. And, but to, to be able to just take it in, you know, that, that, I, one of the things when I was in treatment, they made me go stand in front of a mirror and say, I love you, about killed me, just about killed me. But like they, like I couldn't look at myself in the mirror or whatever, like I was looking down and the, they made me practice that. I, that was one of the things I had to do. And, and that was incredibly different, difficult, but it also um, made such a difference with things is like, I had to, I had to start somewhere. And, and so, you know, I think, like you said, acknowledge that that's really difficult for me, but, but to, to take a pause, take it in and say, thank you. That's, this is something I'm working on is just to be able to take that. in. I appreciate the compliment. Thank you. You know, I, yeah. but I, to not have that quick rapid, Oh, you know, I mean, because it's real, that's a, that's a deflection mechanism. And so to, okay. And then I would even encourage you to, to write it down on a post-it note, you know, Kelly said, you know, this compliment and stick it up there and reread it, you know, and, and just keep absorbing that. I mean, th those are, you know, like you said, the cards, I'm thinking what a great, you know, great connecting point too, but like people write little messages in it, you know, or thank you for something, mm -hmm. you know, I save those because those are meaningful to me. And sometimes when I'm having a down moment, it's like, okay, to pull something out and go, you know, this person took the time to write me a card and say, thank you about whatever, you know, something that I might've even thought it was like, not that big of a deal, but it was meaningful to them. So I do the same thing. Like I get cards and I have a box of them and and, you know, I have this um, box called When Skies Are Gray. And maybe I'll oh. do one of, my, um, one of my things that one of these months on my When Skies Are Gray box because the stuff I have in there is very specific and talks to many different things. And when I'm really, really in a dark place, I pull out my When Skies Are Gray box and go through it. And it reminds me of all the reasons I'm fighting. And so I'm like that too. I'm kind of a pack rat with sentimental um, cards that can inspire me or notes from somebody. I have probably on my phone, 2000 screenshots of people who say, okay, yeah. I love your book, or I love this post, this post changed my life. And, you know, I had one gentleman who commented on Instagram and said, um, like your posts mean something to me every day. And he said, um, all I can tell you is like, when I got to this post, I unloaded my gun. And wow. I just like, Oh, I mean, I had to say that, like, it just reminded me that we think that, you know, we make a post and we say what we think about something, but we don't really know how many people are receiving it. And that's why it's just so important to keep spreading all the hope that we can. I mean, you know, we just don't know how many people are affected by our ability to share who we are. So let's talk about where people can connect with you. Okay. 
Um, well, my of course I'm on social media. Um, Facebook, I'm just Kelly Gunter is my personal page, and I have an Spell it. Oh, K E L L E Y G U N T E R. And then I have an author page as well on Facebook. On Instagram, I'm at Gunter Kelly, so it's just backwards. And my website is kellygunter.com, or they can put in the title of the book, You Have Such a Pretty Face.com. Um, they can put in homecoming queen of crazy town.com. It all goes to the same place. I also have a group on Facebook called the Trauma Tribe. And oh. I think there's about 1,200 people in there. And it's all just for survivors of trauma. And um, I'm also an admin in the group Victims of Violent Crime. And that's about 8,000 people in there. And so it's like a lot of support for the community. And um, I have a blog. And I also um, partner with Dr. Nina from LA Talk Radio. And we have a um, sub subscription group called Binge, Binge Free Babes. And it deals with emotional eating. So our whole premise in there is it's not what you're eating. It's what's eating at you. And so that's just a powerful, powerful group that um, we have women from all over the world. We have people in there from London, from all over. Um, you know, it really encompasses and works on all of the underlying issues that we use food as comfort. And it's just been amazing to see the progress that these women have made. That group is just for women. But um, so that's pretty much everywhere you can find me. My blog is on my website, um, which is ramblings from the homecoming queen of crazy town. And so um, lots of inspirational stuff there. Well, those are great resources too. And, and, and I'm, I, I wanted you to spell all that out because like I said, people are finding this on video as well. So for all of you joining us, these videos, yeah. This is recorded and it will be posted on sexandrelationshiphealing.com under um, resources. You'll see previous webinars and you'll you'll see that. And then they also are on our YouTube channel. So, um, so I want people to be able to find those because those are all very different and unique resources. And so many people that have struggled, you know, as a partner, you know, which we've had, or you know, as someone struggling with addiction, you know, with those types of issues, and to be able to find good support resources. And then what I always find too is when I'm in a resource, I find more resources. So, so oh, yeah. I can connect with other people or other groups and things like that. So it really is, you know okay, that one was helpful. And now this one. So it, you know, there, there, there is so much support. So when we're feeling like we started off with in a pandemic, I'm all alone. Nope, not, not even close, not you know? Yeah. There, there really are, you know, reliable resources and, you know, we are really worth, you know, the investment of, of that. So um, any other questions before we uh, wrap it up for today? So if you do, you can post them in the Q and A. I can also say that if anybody's interested in my book, they can get it on my website or they can get it on Amazon or Kindle or Barnes and Noble. It's on audiobooks, so iTunes, it's pretty much everywhere. But, yep. um, you know, if they order from my website, I sign those books. So, um, you know, just leave your name and I'll sign it for you. Um, That's awesome. So, yeah. yes, I have a copy. It's great. So I appreciate <laughs> it. So. Well, since we don't have any more um, questions, uh, we will wrap this one up for today. And I will look forward to seeing you the first week of February and we'll continue okay. the conversations. But for those of you that are listening or hear this, please, if you have, I mean, she does life coaching. If, you know, if that's something that you could benefit from, please reach out to Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. So um, um, make sure that you uh, get the support that you need. So thank you. I'm grateful for you. This has been uh, enlightening and inspiring. So I'm never going to look at tulips the same. So <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.